Coming up. Watch your fingers. Ouch, my finger! We replace the rod bearings. And how does it run now? Hello and welcome back to the second part of Project Rottweil. This heavily neglected E39 530i touring was sitting and rotting in the back of the dealership lot for years, when I rescued it with the purpose of putting it back where it belongs, on the road. We are going to completely rejuvenate this fine automobile and turn it into a reliable, comfortable daily driver. In part 1 we verified that the engine has good compression, rebuilt the Vanos, removed the intake manifold, dropped the subframe to get to the oil pan and rattling catalytic converters. Now we are picking up the action where we left off in the previous episode. Let's see the oil pump nut. Is it loose? Nah. Remove the oil pickup tube. Okay, good people. I had a late night discussion with my board members and we decided that we were going to do the rod bearings on this engine. I wasn't planning to because M54 normally doesn't have any issues with rod bearings. But you know what? This thing clearly didn't have regular oil changes. We're going to supercharge it, plus we're already here, so might as well do it. Now we're gonna remove the sprocket because the oil pump needs to come out as well. This is a left-hand thread, so you undo it clockwise. Say hello to the bottom end. Now I need to go up top and remove the spark plugs so we can remove the rod caps and push the pistons up. Now we're gonna remove these two rod caps and note that they're stamped on the side and there's a matching number on the connecting rod. You can't mix rod caps around. You have to match them with the connecting rod and put them back in the same way you took them out. Otherwise, your engine is gonna go boom, boom. Hold the cap and remove the bolts. Don't drop this. Yep, this one has some wear. Now we need to push the piston up and remove the upper bearings. Push them all the way up and clear the crankshaft. Man, plenty of space here. Clean carbonious towel. The crankshaft is in fantastic condition. No scoring marks, scratches or anything like that. It just looks perfect. M54s sure can take abuse. The rod bearings have obvious wear. These are the lower ones and these are the top ones. You can see here, this was the first top initial layer. Then this grayish surface is the second layer and now it's down to this third layer and in some places even down to the fourth layer, which is this shiny surface. Out of all of these, this one looks the best, even though it has a lot of pitting, but it's just down to the second layer. So I'm definitely glad we're doing this. That being said, this isn't horrible, horrible, but it ain't good either. New rod bolts and rod bearings just arrived. These are Aussie boys from ACL, and then we have boys from the US, from ARP. You have all of the reassuring words here. Race, performance, professional quality. All joking aside, these are fantastic quality. I decided to go with ACL because they are performance bearings. These are tri-metal bearings and then ARP rod bolts. I use these on Project Rally as well. They are fantastic quality and they are not stretched to yield bolts, so we don't need to torque with the degree and all that nonsense. These are one-time torque to 36 foot-pounds using ARP fastener assembly loop and then you can reuse them after that as well. Now we're gonna use a fine scotch brite and brake cleaner to clean the surface here. Now we're gonna go rinse this out with a brake cleaner and blow it out with compressed air. So with OEM bearings, you have upper and lower rod bearings. With ACL, you don't have that. You can put them wherever you want. Line up the notch and install the bearing. Make sure it's fully seated. The discoloration that you see here, it's totally normal. I already asked ACL about that and it's from the manufacturing process. Because we're using non-stock bearings, we are going to check the clearance with plastic gauge. We're going to put a little bit of silicone spray on the bearing, otherwise it's going to be really difficult to remove the plastic gauge. Now I'm going to prepare the other one as well. Now the rod bolts. These are rod bolts specifically for the M54 engine. Now we're gonna apply fastener assembly lube underneath the head of the bolt. And also on the threads. 
Now we need to clean the place for the upper bearings on the connecting rod. I'm gonna turn the engine a little bit, just have a bit better access. Ideally, we would use Scotch Brite here as well, but it's a bit risky because you need to clean the residue that it leaves behind thoroughly. And since this is inside of the engine, we're not gonna do it because I can't clean 100% there. So clean carbon fiber, brake cleaner, and just clean. Clean gloves and install the upper bearing. Here as well, we need to line up the notch and make sure we install the bearing correctly. And that's two upper bearings installed. Clean carbon fiber. This one is French. And carefully clean the crankshaft. It needs to be clean and dry in order to get correct measurements. Now grab and lower the connecting rod onto the crank. The torque for ARP rod bolts is 36 foot-pounds, which comes to 48.81 Newton meters, so we're going to torque them to 49. I switched the plastic edge to the green one because I realized I'm running low on the red one, and I want to use the same kind on all of the journals. Rod bearing clearance for the M54 engine is between 0 0.020 millimeters to 0 0.055 millimeters. Here we have something between 0 0.038 and 0 0.051 millimeters. Not as high as 0.51, but something in between. So we are within spec. That's great. And again, plastic gauge is not going to give us precise results. It's just going to tell us that we are in ballpark and that we are safe to proceed. Here we are within specs, so you can go ahead and do the final assembly. Push the connecting rod up so we can apply assembly lube on the bearing. Clean the crank one more time. Clean finger and assembly lube. Just to be clear, I'm not flipping you off. This is just my longest finger. So I can reach. I like to do a bit of fogging oil for men on the crankshaft. And I'll ring it down. To clean the cap, don't use brake cleaner, just fresh oil and clean. Carbonius, and just give it a nice wipe. Assembly lube. If needed, we can add a bit more lube on the bolts. These look pretty good, so I'm just going to add a tiny bit. Tighten them by hand first, evenly. And then one nice swing with the torque wrench, and I'm going to copy paste with the rest of them. Done. Give it a nice spin. Make sure the engine turns over nice and smooth without any resistance. And it sure does. This was relatively straightforward and easy compared to V8s, V10s, and V12s that I've done in the past. I plastic gauged all of the journals and got consistent readings across all six of them which is excellent. And this bottom end is ready to rock and roll. These are the old rod bearings, and as you can see, they are pretty decently worn. Some of them have a lot of pitting as well. That's due to lack of lubrication and lots of dirt in the oil. Thankfully, the crankshaft is in mint condition. There are no scratches, scoring marks, or anything like that. This is what happens when you don't maintain your car properly and change the oil regularly. The inside of the engine looks like a dumpster fire and your rod bearings want to go dancing rather sooner than later. Quite honestly, I'm not sure how long these would last with the supercharger, so I'm really glad we replaced them. Now we're going to inspect the oil pump. 
We have a mark here and here, and that's how we're going to know how to put it back together. Gonna go rinse this out with brake clean. This one is in great condition. There are no scratches or deep scoring marks, so usable. This piece as well is in good condition. We have a valve here as well that I want to remove and clean. There you go, it's coming out. Shouldn't that shoot out? Isn't there a spring, my man? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and put this in the ZZ machine, clean it up, and then we're gonna put it back together. Look at that, brand new oil pump. I gotta say the dusty degreaser works really well. This was cooking in there for about two hours and it didn't discolor aluminum at all. It just made it nice and shiny again. So that was a really nice tip. Thank you. Now we can reassemble it. This thing was stuck and it popped out while it was in the ultrasonic cleaner. The piston plunger thing, I don't think this was stuck, but it was really gummed up and dirty inside. So I am really glad that we took it apart and cleaned it. Now we can also replace the o-ring and reassemble the pump. piston needs to move smoothly and freely, which it does. Now the spring. There we go. That's in. This is a very simple oil pump. We are going to go with 10 millimeters. Make sure it's spinning freely and easily. And this pump is ready to go back in. The baffle plate, which went for a swim in the ZZ machine. And then 10 millimeters for the little guy in the back. I've cleaned this up in the ZZ machine, turned out good. Brand new o-ring. We are going to use safety wire to secure the nut in place. I bought this online from this company. Comes with a wire and this nut has holes in it so we can tie it to the sprocket and that way it can't go anywhere. Loctite. This is a left hand thread. The torque is 25 Nm, but as my torque wrench can torque in reverse, we're gonna go with good and tight. Counter hold the crank and just make sure it's nice and snug. Don't go too crazy. Not too bad, given that I'm doing this for the first time with improper pliers. And if the nut were to become loose and it starts on doing that way, the wire is gonna hold it in place. There's no way it can come off. This oil pan has non-removable baffle plate, which unfortunately means we can't blast it in the cabinet. See all of this sludge and varnish? If we were to blast this, media will stick to this sludge, especially in places that I can't see or reach. And then once the engine is working again, that media will end up circulating in the oil and wipe out the bearings. So it's simply not worth the risk. I'm gonna clean this by hand, but first let's see if we have any treasures here. Any chunks of anything? Let's clean. Ooh, sludgy. It's actually not as bad as I thought it would be. If you remember on E46, we had literal turds in the oil pan. Oh my God, look. All right, I'm gonna go clean this by hand, so I'll see you in about three and a half days. Clean oil pan. Next time I'm drilling out and removing this stupid baffle so I can blast this in the cabinet and then I'll figure out how to reattach it because this was a monumental waste of time to clean it by hand. It took me forever and it is squeaky clean. It's stained, but it's squeaky clean and that's the most important thing here. Couple of zip ties to hold it in place. We also have a brand new OE oil level sensor. One of the rare things that Hella still makes in Germany. 
you can see that B&W logo was scraped off. Peter Ryan's the seal where the covers meet. In the back as well. Oil level sensor. Brand new crash washer for the drain plug. Now we're gonna replace the dog elated converters. Gonna remove the support arm so we have better access. <clears throat> I guess there is at least one thing that we can vapor blast. I already removed O2 connectors on the top. Everything hurts. There's one. Batard. This is our winner. This is the offending article, dog elated converter for cylinders four to six. And it's not the cat itself that fell apart. It is the design of this entire exhaust manifold that's really poor. And it's actually a common issue, or well, somewhat a common issue on M54. There is a clamp or a band in the middle of this thing that gets loose over time. And then you end up with this noise. Rattle that is. So I'm gonna post a video that I found on YouTube of someone cutting open this thing and you can see exactly what went wrong. Yeah. So I'm gonna fix this the OEM plus way, though I can't show you that because reasons. So we're gonna skip ahead and start vapor blasting this engine support arm. Vixen surface treatments, Aquablast 1215 time. Engine support arm going back in. Next up, the subframe. We are going to upgrade the sway bar with the M Sport one. Now we're gonna replace the engine mounts and they're not as bad as I thought they would be. Has some cracks on the side. Brand new Lamforta parts. Now you're gonna do the tie rods. Oh, it's 32. Here we have brand new Lamforta parts. Now I need to match the length of the old one with the new one so we can get the alignment as close as possible. But once the car is done, it's going in for wheel alignment nonetheless. That's close enough. Brilliant. Want to hear something interesting? Both of the tie rods are made by Lemforder, but this one here is made in Germany and that one over there is made in Malaysia. And you can see clear difference in the finish. This one is an exact match to the original one, so OE part. This one here isn't. Same with the engine mounts, both made by Lemforder. That one is made in Germany, that one is made in China. Exact match to the OE one, has nothing to do with the OE one. And I tried to find uh, both of these made in Germany, the rest of the parts, but I just, I couldn't find them. It's pretty much impossible because Lemforder is switching their production all over the world. And sometimes you get lucky, you get parts that are made in Germany that are usually old stock. Wanna bet which one is gonna last longer? Yeah, we'll see. It's gonna be an interesting comparison, if anything. Brand new power steering line. <laughs> 
Brand new sway bar. This is the M Sport 2 sway bar for cars with M Sport suspension because we are installing M Sport springs and struts. And I got this one directly from the dealer. This one is 25 millimeters thick. The old one is 22. And this is made by Eibach. See right over there? And it's the original part, 180 euros. Got new bushings as well. I hate these stickers every time. Three hours later, scraping the damn sticker off. Up from time. There it is. Here you go. Power string line. Power string pulley. Now I'm gonna reconnect the steering column. Oh no. Oh yeah. Okay, that's in. PIS does not list a torque spec for engine mount bolts, so we're just gonna go with good and tight. Steering column bolt with medium thread locker applied. Now we're going to attack the prop shaft, replace the flex joint, the center shaft bearing, and the transmission bushings as well. It doesn't look too bad. Now we're gonna support the transmission and then I can remove the cross member. These have seen better days. Now I'm going to mark the position of the center shaft bearing. So I forgot on E39 there's butyl in between center shaft bearing and the chassis. <laughs> this is a rather light prop shaft. Brand new flex joint, center shaft bearing, and transmission mounts. The center shaft bearing is surprisingly good. You can hear the bearing just a little bit, but that really isn't all that bad. Usually when they go bad, they're super noisy. I have a brand new one, so we're gonna replace it anyway, since everything is out of the car. Now we need to split the prop shaft. There's a bolt here that we need to undo, and then this will split, but we also need to mark and put back these two halves together in the same position, because this is all balanced together. <clears throat> That's the thing separated. We can cut around it and remove the bracket that way. Now I need to remove the bearing. Got a puller here. Stop it! Scotch bright. Make sure this is lined up. Now we need to start the bolt. <sighs> I'd say that's torqued. This one is whisper quiet. It's very important to install the flex joint correctly. This arrow here needs to point towards the flange on the prop shaft, and this one here will point towards the flange on the transmission. If you install it the other way around, the flex joint is going to wear out prematurely. These are M12 10.9 grade bolts, and they are torqued to 100 Nm, and we torque by the nut as per per manual.
Now we need to put the butyl on the center shaft bearing and you can buy that directly from the dealer, which I forgot to do. So I have some generic butyl here. Real OEM has the specs that we need, which is 190 millimeters long, 20 millimeters wide and eight mil thick. So this one here is gonna work just fine for that, but I'm gonna use two lines here in order to achieve 20 mil. You need to remove the residue from the old one. Now we're gonna put mineral oil on the surface here as per the repair manual. If we were to put it in dry, butyl will want to stick to the chassis wherever, which can end up deforming the butyl tape. I'm putting this back the same way I took it out. A washer goes in between the flex joint and the flange. And I'm using old bolts because the new ones are too long. It's a bit tricky or near impossible to torque by the nut here. So we're simply going to increase the torque by 10% and torque by the bolt. And that's 110 millimeters. Torque spec for these is 32 millimeters, but again, can't fit the torque wrench here. So we're gonna go with good and tight. I don't want to use the chicken foot extensions because I don't like them. Brand new transmission mounts. Before I put the heat shields back on, I'm gonna coat the transmission with ACF 50, which is anti-corrosion fluid. I've been testing this thing for a while and it works really well. I actually coated this cross member with that and it's gonna preserve the vapor blasted finish for at least several years. And this stuff is not sticky like fluid film, it's sort of transparent. Just gonna get it everywhere. I'm gonna go around the entire transmission tunnel and just spray this stuff everywhere. Clean heat shields. We have brand new OE knock sensors and original coolant lines that run underneath of the intake manifold. Now I'm gonna do coolant lines one by one. Silicon spray. That's the coolant lines replaced. Next up, brand new original cold weather CCV, intake boots, intake manifold gasket, silicon lines to replace the rubber ones that are perished all around the engine, and brand new OE fuel injectors. After the incident on Alpina where the injectors started leaking heavily right after cleaning them, I'm not taking that chance anymore and just going for brand new injectors whenever I can. These are definitely not cheap. They're 100 euros each, six cylinders, you do the math. But on the other hand, this is not something that I'm gonna do that often once in 15, 20 years, if even that. And I know they're going to last and work perfectly. My gut! They look positive and nasty. They probably still work fine, but I mean, look at that. Pretty gnarly, huh? I have O-ring grease from Molly Cote here. We need to lube up the o-ring, otherwise we can tear it. Clips. I bought this temperature sensor new as well. Why is there so much sand there? Brand new OE Hello one. Now I gotta remove and clean the idle control valve. Yeah, that doesn't sound good. Should click and move a lot easier than this. 
So I got some throttle cleaner. Let that sit on the side and we can replace the CCV here. There it is. 2013. Someone did replace this. It is a non-original part though. Not branded at all. Cold weather package CCV is going to last a bit longer because of all of this insulation and stuff. That clicked into place. Next up, we're gonna replace this valve here. I ordered a new one just because. This one connects to this one. And then this one here connects to the port on the carb. Gonna replace this valve and lines as well. Here's the new one. Here's what the idle control valve sounds like now. Moving freely. Nice. If you're doing maintenance on the car, this is something that you can clean rather easily without removing the intake manifold. And now the oil dip it. Now you're gonna replace these O-rings here. And now we need to make sure that this thing is not clogged. It's not. And lastly, brand new O-ring. Now I'm gonna replace the rest of the vacuum lines and prep the surface. So we need to clip in knock sensors, connect the bottom CCV hose, and now the big intake manifold nut. Now you can torque the lower bolt that holds the intake manifold to the block. Nut, that is. CCV connection here. Clean throttle issues with a brand new gasket. Lower intake boot. Brand new power steering lines and power steering reservoir. We're gonna set this loosely for now and grab the alternator. I decided to go for a furbished Bosch alternator. The old one was a bit noisy. And of course, new pulleys and belts. <sighs> Mustn't forget the positive cable in the back. Brand new thermostat, water pump, and billet aluminum water pump pulley. The stock one is made from plastic, so this is an upgrade. A nice subscriber sent me this one a very long time ago, and I finally have a use for it. Bit of silicone spray on the O-ring. And now the diesel valve, this is the one that I removed from the car, an aftermarket unit, and you can't use these on the M54 engine. This one is already broken, and the average lifespan of the aftermarket unit is about one year, and then you can throw it into the garbage because they're not rebuildable. Had to buy a brand new original part from the dealer, 250 European shillings, but these have a design flaw. Components inside wear out, and then this flap here becomes loose. You can get a rattle at idle, you can get a rough idle, and this can come 
off completely and end up in your intake manifold. So we are going to bulletproof it with German Auto Solutions Rebuild Kit, which I got from Propsten Tech from Jorg. So he has this rebuild kit on his website, as well as rebuild service and rebuild kits for any Venus unit on any BMW. So I highly recommend checking him out. Super nice guy, really helpful and knowledgeable. Thank you, Jorg. This is actually one of the first repairs that I've done on my original E39. It had a massive rattle on idle from the diesel valve. It's been about seven, eight years since I've done that. First, we need to remove this cover here. By the way, to test your old diesel valve, close it and hold your finger over the vacuum port here and it should hold the flap, something like that. This white plastic in here is the bell crank lever and it's the part that normally wears out. Now we need to remove this retaining clip here. Now we need to pry up this lever here. Now we can use the wire that was supplied with the kit and just tie the lever on the side so it's not in our way. Like that, and now we need to remove this white piece of plastic and for that we're gonna use this supplied screw. Start the screw. Now we need to pry up. Next step is to pry between the flap and the frame so we can expose this pin here and pull it out. We're gonna pry right there. You can see now that the pin is exposed and we can pull it out all the way. This is the old plastic flap. And this is our new aluminum one that came pre-assembled, so we need to disassemble it. This is the supplied grease. We're gonna apply grease on the inner lip here and on our crank lever, just here, not on the tapered section. Now we need to position the lever and push it all the way in. This is the position you want it in, and now we need to clean this tapered section here, make sure it's free of grease and then push it back in while holding it on the other side. Now we're going to use supplied Loctite, smeared on the inside of the flap. Now we can position the flap and we can use the old pin just to hold it in place temporarily. Now we need to hold the flap like this at a 90 degree angle and then push the lever all the way in from the other side. Put the washer on the pivot screw and apply thread locker on the threads. Now we can put the screw in. Now we can close the flap and tighten the screw. Now make sure the flap opens and doesn't bind. Some slight resistance is normal. Now we can put the lever back onto the crank thing. Now we can put the clip and secure the lever in place. We don't want to push it all the way in. The lever needs to have a bit of free play. You can use a socket for that. Like that, not all the way in. So this lever here has a bit of free play. Now we can perform the test again. It is normal if this doesn't spring back fully. When we do this test manually, the membrane will get a kink and won't open fully, but this doesn't happen once it's back on the car and working. The kit also comes with a brand new O-ring, but since this is a brand new unit here, I don't need to replace it. And that's it. Very simple and very effective repair. This is now a bulletproof diesel valve that's going to last probably the lifetime of the car. intake boot, the rest of the cooling system components, brand new original expansion tank, OE bear fan clutch, fan shot, fan blade, OE male radiator, sensor, and coolant lines. Ouch, my finger! Now three billion coolant lines. All right, ah, oh, my back. Okay, that's all of the lines clipped in. Fully seated, ran your clips. That's all you need to do with the fan clutch. No need to go crazy here because it spins in the opposite direction. You can come off. And if you over torque it, you're gonna have a hell of a time taking it off next time you need to service the car. 
connect the sensor clip and the bleed screw. Brand new OE Continental slash video mass airflow sensor, the only one you can use on this engine. Put a replica and it's never gonna run right. And of course, a fresh filter. Time for the bodily fluids. We have goodies from Liquid Molly, 5W40 oil, coolant, and power steering fluid. I'm putting 0W40 first because we're going to start the engine, run it for 10-15 minutes, get it up to operating temperature and then change the oil immediately because we replaced the rod bearings and had the engine open. So I just want to get that oil out as soon as possible. And then we're going to put 5W40. Now we need to add coolant and bleed the cooling system. Turn the ignition on, set the temperature to highest and the fan to the lowest setting. Open up the bleed screws. Of course. As soon as that starts coming out bubble free, it's time to close it. I hate the fact that when you bleed a cooling system on this engine, you always have to make a mess. Cool, now we're gonna jump underneath and do one piece of maintenance that's often overlooked. The fuel filter, which lives behind this plastic. There you go. Look at that jacking point. Looks like someone serviced this one. I don't know, I just work here. Look at that jacking point. In really good condition. So we're gonna coat all of this in fluid film. Oh. Bosh. Do we have a date here? That is negative. Brand new fuel filter, OE cool line fuel lines, and some clamps and the uh, vacuum line. Little bit of silicone spray. As you can see, all of this is nice and rust free and obviously we wanna keep it that way. So we're gonna protect it against rust. I'm gonna apply cable grease from Liquid Molly which is like fluid film, only better because it doesn't smell like rotten apples. And it's rust protective film, looks like that. And I think it's gonna work better than ACF50 because ACF50, although really good, it's too liquidy. The section that I coated here, it just keeps dripping on my floor and I don't like that. So we're just gonna go around and do this. Eventually I'm gonna coat the entire underside of the car with this because this car will be driven in winter. Also very important to spray inside of the chassis. In the side skirts, this will help big time to prevent them from rusting. Cause that's one of the first things that go on E39. I highly recommend doing this every winter. I pulled the fuel pump fuse and disconnected the ignition coils so the engine can't start. Now we're gonna crank it over to build up oil pressure. Obviously we replaced the rod bearings, took apart the oil pump, rebuilt the vanos, and we wanna get the oil moving in the engine before we actually start it. Bit more, sounds good. That'll do it. Now we can check the fluids. Ooh, definitely need parsing fluid. Now we're gonna start the engine and if it sounds good, let it get up to operating temperature and then change the oil. Cycle the key a couple of times. Build up fuel pressure. Just wanna check the power string level. We're gonna have a lot of stuff burning off everywhere. Needs a bit more power string fluid. 
We need more oil. Turn the steering wheel from lock to lock a couple of times. Bleed the parsing system. The engine sounds great, by the way. The rough idle in the beginning, though, is just building up fuel pressure. What do you think, huh? Sounds good. Any obvious leaks? So far, so good. It's good to hold the revs a little bit. Get the oil pump spinning faster. I'm quite happy. How about you? Gonna enjoy this Chiese pretzel until the engine gets up to operating temperature. You sound good, my man. A lot better than before. Wouldn't you agree? Clean. As it should be. 5W40 oil. Cold start. Beautiful. Oh, that's the secondary air bullshit. Secondary air pump. Anyone want knoppers? Okay. Some crumbs for you as well, my friend. Now I can reassemble the engine bay. I also replaced this gasket here. Brand new cabin air filters. Now it purrs like a kitten. Loads of condensation from the exhaust, so we need to properly drive it. I also have a different exhaust coming. That one is really ugly, as you can see, just one nasty tailpipe. And that's the ladies and senoras, M54 B30 engine successfully rejuvenated. It sounds beautiful. It's ready for another 150,000, if not 200,000 kilometers, but with proper maintenance. Before we close off this episode, I just wanna see how well the paint on this car can clean up. So we're gonna do a little test spot here. Surface prep. I believe the fingerprints that are all over the car are Sunscreen from kids running around and touching the car. That's the only good explanation that I got so far. Should come out though. <laughs> oh, wow. Holy shit. <laughs> this is just after a couple of quick passes without a final polish. The before and after in this car is gonna be huge. And that big deep scratch there goes all the way down. Almost completely gone here. Can't see it. So yeah, the paint is gonna come back around beautifully. Just need to get the PDR guy because the car has a tremendous amount of dents to remove all of that and then we can we can polish the paint and it's gonna look beautiful I am really pleased with the progress so far in the next episode we are going to continue with the rejuvenation process and overhaul the complete suspension brakes we have new wheels few odds and ends and then the car is ready for tooth inspection thank you so much for watching and I hope that you enjoyed this episode see you in the next one